Okay, welcome to NUPE, everybody. Good morning, Madam Minister. Very pleased to see you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this was uh, an unexpected and very uh, good turnout uh, so early in the morning. I'm glad you chose to come to listen to a very exciting topic at NUPE instead of enjoying the, the summer day outside. Uh, my name is Osman Veltin. I'm the Communications Director at NUPI and uh, will be uh, the chair for this session. Today's uh, seminar we have called Fisheries Resources Resource Management in Tomorrow's Indonesia. And, and this is a very important and, and interesting topic. In my view, Indonesia has received less attention than uh, it deserves in Norway. Indonesia is a very very large, very populated uh, country with a, an enormous coastline. We, we like to think that Norway has a very big coastline as well, but it's nothing compared to Indonesia. Fisheries is, has a very, plays a very, very important role in Indonesia. The, the, the ocean is, is what binds Indonesia together. And that's true for Norway as well. And in this uh, respect, Norway and Indonesia has strengthened uh, its cooperation over the last few years. We have a bilateral relationship. It's getting stronger. Norwegians are discovering that Indonesia is a very important market, a very important country, and centrally located in Asia. Um, and we have collaboration on, on many different areas, uh, not the least in fisheries, in forest preservation, and many other areas as well. Uh, just a few words about the, the, ab about the topic of today. Uh, about 100 million people live along the Indonesian coastline. That means that fisheries and coastal industries is Play a, play a very important role in, in Indonesian society. It also means that Indonesia undeniably faces a lot of severe challenges connected to sustainability, to uh, non-legal activities, and to external stressors like climate change, for example. And what we'll hear about today is how uh, Indonesia, through their Minister of Marine Affairs and Fisheries, Ms. Susie Pujastuti, addresses these challenges and uh, how they have, through a policy based on three main pillars, sovereignty, sustainability, and prosperity, aim to, to manage oceans as the main future resource of, of the Indonesian uh, society. Um, now before we um, give the word to Minister Pujastuti, we're also so lucky to, to hear from um, Policy Director at the Ministry of uh, Trade, Industry and Fisheries in Norway, Gunnar Störsvik, who will uh, say a few words about how Norway and Indonesia collaborates on uh, uh, in the battle against the uh, fisheries related crimes. And on a practical note, restrooms are through the door and to your left. This session, this event will be streamed for any, anyone everywhere in the world to, to see. And uh, there will be time for questions after the presentations. We aim to finish at the latest at 10 o'clock. Thank you. And good night. The word is yours. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm uh, very happy to, to uh, uh, to be uh, invited to, to speak here at this uh, important event. And um, so thank you very much, um, ladies and gentlemen, and your excellencies. Um, 
I'm going to talk about what kind of cooperation we have between Indonesia and Norway. And um, I, my area of competence is particularly on, on what we call transnational organized crime in the global fishing industry. We call it fisheries crime. And um, we believe that this is an important part of being able to build a, a sustainable blue economy in a country. Because it goes into to the pillar of uh, sovereignty and to protect your sovereign rights, uh, the fisheries resources of, uh, of your own country. But it also um, um, uh, goes into the governance issues, um, which is important to be able to build a strong and uh, resilient uh, blue economy. So this is, uh, this is actually a picture from, uh, from uh, uh, Vienna. Uh, that's from 2017, uh, when Susi Pujas Tuti and also the Norwegian Minister of, of Fisheries um, uh, was uh, uh, the host together with UNODC and several other agencies of what is called the Fish Crime Symposium. It's a yearly event. Before that, it was in Yogyakarta in uh, Indonesia, which was a highly successful uh, event. And um, so I think this illustrates how Norway and Indonesia on a political level is working together towards um, combating transnational organized fisheries crime not only in our own countries, but also worldwide. And I think that is, uh, is uh, a very interesting and important part of my presentation, is basically to show how we are working and pulling in the same direction. Uh, beside them, we also have the, the Minister of Fisheries from Ecuador, uh, also from South Africa, and uh, I believe it's, um, it's um, the Vice Minister of Fisheries from Thailand on the, to, to the right and also um, uh, the Secretary General of the Nordic Council of Ministers. But I will come back to these issues um, because uh, uh, especially uh, Indonesia, Norway, and the Nordic countries is now pulling in the same direction. <laughs> so uh, just to start with, with the basis of, of the, the, the type of cooperation that we have now on fisheries crime. Um, this is maybe a bit boring <laughs> slide this early in the morning, but this is, this is basically the joint statement by the Norwegian and Indonesian fisheries minister from 2015. Now, the cooperation on these issues stretches beyond before 2015, but this was the, was the first, um, what should I say, a political statement on, on the cooperation. What I think is, is interesting is that we, we don't only cooperate on sustainable fisheries issues through the FAO and, and, um, and the fisheries management processes, but we are also cooperating on the transnational organized crime issues relating to the fisheries. And that can be illustrated by uh, a direct reference to the work in uh, UNODC, UNTOC Convention, but also the issues relating to forced labor, which unfortunately is something that also appears in the global fishing industry in both of our countries, unfortunately. So what is transnational organized fisheries crime? What it is, it is basically all transnational crimes, all crimes committed through the whole value chain. So it's not only about the legal catching of the fish, it is um, a number of issues such as uh, human trafficking, basically slaves being used as forced labor on, on uh, fishing vessels. Uh, it's money laundering, because uh, illegal fishing is generating a huge money flow, and that has to be laundered into the legal market to be able to use it. Um, it is customs and tax fraud, which basically is also depriving the country for the benefits of, of the tax and customs duties. It is a lot of document fraud, which is necessary in all types of economic crime. And of course, also this also has an um, environmental effect, environmental damage. And we have a lot of examples of that. Um, I uh, just recently returned from the Micronesia area, where they told me about um, the problems with sea cucumber 
harvesting and the illegal catching of that and the, the um, environmental damage that this is causing, but also the enormous amounts of money that is involved in this trade. This is a transnational problem that has to be dealt with, not by uh, one country, but a lot of countries together. So um, to handle this problem, you need to go through different doors. And I think that is what I really like about Indonesia, is that you have a presidential task force called Satgas 115. And you introduced the, um, the term multiple door approach. So in the middle of, through all these doors, you have the problem which is transnational organized crime. And you can go through the tax door, through the fisheries door, through the human trafficking door, but you come to the same problem, which is that there is transnational organized crime involved into this global business. And uh, this is also something that we have in common with Indonesia. Myself is the, is the head of, uh, of a similar group in Norway. And we basically have sister organizations, one in Norway and one in Indonesia, and we work together. And we have seen that we work on actual cases, help each other with tracking information, analysis, and so on, but also on workshops in Indonesia and in Norway. So. Um, I'm really happy about how we are supporting each other to, to working on these issues. So this is basically what, how we look at this. Now, just a few pictures from uh, some of our activities. This was, um, and you see it's, it's, a, <laughs> it's a group of very enthusiastic people. Um, this was uh, a tax and economic crime workshop that was held in Jakarta. I believe two years ago, uh, myself was attending, but also from the Norwegian tax authorities was attending, and uh, also uh, many participants from the Indonesian tax, customs, marine police, I believe, and also from, um, uh, from the fisheries authorities in Indonesia. Um, so this is one of the activities, and what we basically is do is that we, we cooperate through a whole through all the different agencies that are relevant through the whole value chain. So it's not enough to just cooperate with the fisheries authorities because the problem is so complex, as transnational organized crime is, that you need to cooperate with all the agencies through the whole value chain. And that is why tax authorities are extremely important because this is all about money. It's not, people are not fishing illegally because they love to fish. It's because they love money. That's the reality. Uh, this is another workshop. This is, um, is judges from, uh, from the different provinces of Indonesia. That's just before Christmas. And um, I was invited to, to tell about um, how we view these issues. Uh, and I believe we had a really good and in-depth discussion about these issues, which I, I think was um, really good. Um, and here it's, uh, this is in Norway, and uh, this is uh, some of the staff from Satgas uh, 115. Uh, and this is at winter time <laughs> in Norway. It's quite <laughs> different from Indonesia. But this is basically a um, uh, North Atlantic Coast Guard cooperation that we have. Um, and um, Indonesia was invited to, to have a presentation because this is also relevant for us. Indonesian fishermen are all over the world. And this cooperation, the North Atlantic Coast Guard Forum, is basically also the eyes of the inspectors when they go to vessels and so on. So we had a good discussions about, about um, how we can support each other. So um, what I would say is that we have actually a, now a, a quite long-standing cooperation between Norway and Indonesia. And, uh, and we are continuing with it. There is a workshop planned for, for August this year, I believe. Uh, with the prosecutors in, uh, in Indonesia and also from other countries around uh, the Indian Ocean. Um, 
but we also have cooperation on a policy level, and I think that is also very important, because it's not enough that only Norway and Indonesia uh, is pulling in the same direction. We need more countries to pull in the same direction, because if we are going to handle transnational organized crime, whether it's in the fishing industry or somewhere else, you need international cooperation. So, uh, one of the, I believe, one of the successes that we have here from Norway, but I believe that also the cooperation with Indonesia is a very, very important part of this, is uh, what we managed last year. It was an initiative by the Norwegian Minister of Fisheries through the Nordic Council of Ministers. So we basically got all the Nordic countries on board. Denmark, Sweden, Finland, um, Iceland, uh, forgotten Orland, a small group of islands in the uh, autonomous area, Faroe Islands, Greenland, important countries in the fisheries context. They are now pulling in the, in the, in the same direction and issued this statement, which is basically laying down uh, um, uh, a common understanding of what kind of challenges we have, both regionally, but also the challenges that we have internationally, and the need for cooperation, international cooperation, not only regionally, but a truly global cooperation to be able to deal with these issues. I recommend to you to, to download the, the statement, which is available on the website of the Nordic Council. And a part of the operationalization of this statement was also that the Nordic Council um, got on board together with Norway and Indonesia to arrange the Fish Crime Symposium in Vienna, in the UN complex in Vienna last year, uh, in partnership with the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. And this is, of course, illustrated for those Norwegians here recognize this person, which is the former health minister of Norway, the one that um, uh, invented the, the smoke, um, uh, the non-smoking policy in, in, in public, in, in restaurants and so on. Um, but he is the general secretary of the Nordic Council of Ministers. So he's, at this meeting, was, uh, was representing all the Nordic countries. But, um, and this symposium, I believe, is an important part of the policy building. Um, and um, this is um, from the website of this year's symposium. And uh, Anna Solberg, our Prime Minister, she has a, a quote. And basically what she's saying is that, that we have seen the rise of a global movement against transnational organized crime in the fishing industry with more and more states supporting the cause. And I think that summarizes what is the goal of this event from we started, because we need more countries on board and we need high level commitment and to understand that this is an important component also to, to, um, to be able to, um, to reach the SDG goals not only gold 14, which is about life underwater, but it, it stretches more far than that, also on organized crime issues, on poverty, and uh, building a, um, a sustainable economy. All of, it's, it's a cross-cutting issue for those countries that are dependent and have rich natural resources. Um, just as an example, I was in Palau um, uh, just a few weeks ago, this small country with 17,000 people have an economical zone as big as France. It's enormous. They have enormous resources. This is important for countries with such big resources to be able to, ha to use those resources without the involvement of transnational organized um, crime groups that are basically stealing the resources. This is important. And that is what we are trying to achieve through this, uh, this uh, high-level meeting. And this meeting will be in uh, Copenhagen uh, this year. 
It's in cooperation with, uh, with uh, a number of international organizations, Interpol, UNODC, but also new for this year is, the, is UN, uh, UNDP. It's the it's Nordic country of UNDP that has its headquarter in this building, which is the UN city building in Copenhagen. Um, and they, uh, they also are on board on this issue because there is an important governance issue in all of this, uh, this uh, problem. In addition, we have, of course, Indonesia, we have the Nordic Council of Ministers, Sweden, um, the Faroe Islands, um, and the North Atlantic Fisheries Intelligence Group, uh, which is basically a group of uh, experts. It's uh, headed by the tax authority in Norway. They were the one that took the initiative. And I think that also illustrates how we are thinking through that whole value chain. This is how you have to think if you're going to combat transnational organized crime. And, uh, and also the research network on fisheries crime called Pescadolos. And of course, my own ministry. I almost forgot that. So what is this committed global community? This is some of them. This is high-level people. We have Susi Pudiastuti that have supported this course, pro I believe, from the beginning when you took office. Um, we're very, very grateful about that. And we have the Norwegian political leadership, but we also, through this political statement through the Nordic Council, we also bring on board high-level support from all the Nordic countries. And uh, I believe that this is an um, important part of what we are building uh, on a policy level for these issues. I would, uh, just before I close, just to, to, to do some advertisement for, for participation at the, the symposium. Uh, it's basically a whole week of activities on fish risk. <coughs> Not all of it is open for the general public, but it is particularly the Monday and Tuesday uh, which is the symposium which is uh, open for the public. But I think it's interesting to know that there are activities also for, for law enforcement um, uh, uh, people, which would be the rest of the week. And that is basically through the Interpol Fisheries Crime Working Group. But if we focus on the two first days, so there is going to be a symposium, which is basically to bring up all the good ideas and, and experiences on combating transnational organized crime in the fishing industry. Um, we expect political participation. And also before lunch, there will also be a session for those countries that identify themselves as large ocean nations. Norway identify us as that. REEC -E is seven times bigger than the mainland of Norway. So we have huge interest in what's happening at sea. Um, I believe Indonesia in the same situation and a number of other countries. It's a more positive way as looking at small island states, saying that let's focus on what you have of resources, of what area, what sea area do you have control or have access to. So. I think this is, is quite interesting. This is um, also very heavily supported by the Nordic Council, <laughs> which most countries in the Nordic Council is identifying themselves as large ocean nations. So I believe that this is also something that we will continue to cooperate on in the future. And I hope to see as many of you in Copenhagen as possible. So by this, I will close my presentation and uh, I'm looking <coughs> forward to hear the presentation of, uh, of Susie. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Gunnar. And uh, with no further ado, for preparing your PowerPoint, uh, Madam Minister. Uh, I'll give you the word.
Thank you very much for the opportunity. Distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen, so good night, Ambassador Indonesia to Den to Norway, all the ambassadors that represent today in this uh, occasion. So the chair and Gunnar, I think, is already giving quite a bit uh, uh, overview on what Indonesia is. We have the second largest uh, coastal line in the world, and we had 17,000 islands, so it's very huge. But in the last two decades, I would say we did not benefit the resource of the big oceans we have to our wealth and to our economic growth. Why was that happen? We had, first of course, Indonesia did not look that much into the big oceans. We had been busy trying to develop our country on base of agriculture. We dream our, our country that's independence in 1945 on land development, most into the agriculture. So we did not uh, see our ocean as a big part of us. While the fact we have 71% oceans with the lake, with the river, probably ocean uh, territorial and is that we have is more than 80%. So land is actually only 15%. 1957, finally, the world uh, agreed to give uh, a proof on state archipelagic. So that's why Indonesia finally have all the oceans around us, united the islands to become a country. Without declaration of Juanda 1957, we would be separate, uh, so separated state with 17,000 islands, because we only have three miles from our coastal lines. But now with the, with the Juanda declarations, we have all waters united Indonesia as 17,000 become one state country. So my work start was uh, October 2014, where the new president of Indonesia at that time, Bapa Joko Widodo, gave the new visions that Indonesia should become the maritime axis to start dominating the economy in maritime and also to start thinking and vis uh, viewing the visions to the future that Indonesia should get its future nations from the oceans, which is very re realistic and and, and definitely it should because 71% of our, our territorial and EZ is uh, oceans. So we should not depend that much anymore to our land. So regarding the visions of my presidents, I put three pillars as what the chairs and uh, uh, Gunnar was also mentioned with uh, sovereignty. Of course, sovereignty means for Minister of Marine Affairs is not sovereignty in security-wise, but more into the, its resources. So the second is sustainability, and the third, of course, as a result of the two being implemented uh, and enforced, we will have the prosperity given to all our oceans, our maritime stakeholder. But with the fact all the problems we have in the last two decades, especially reference into the survey that we have done, census data of 2003 to 2013, where we lost almost 50% of our fisheries household. We lost 115 of export business on seafood, uh, wild catch, mm. uh, manufacturer and uh, uh, freezing, uh, facility, we, we have to shut it down because there's no more material. Of course, the people who who that time did not really aware why what become happened that way. We thought we had been overfishing ourselves, so don't think that much. But to see what has happened in our in, in our Fisheries management that time, 2001, Indonesian start giving 
concession license for fishing to foreign vessel. So I could not until today find the real data exactly how many thousand had been foreign fishing vessel get concession in our oceans, but the last data we wo- we we were uh, we were having was 1,300. But in reality, by analysis and investigation on time uh, by the time, we see that actually out there there are more than ten times the vessel than its license or its 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 concess license by our uh, government. So and that's proof by the information and confirmations from all the player. I call here the agency. I call them one by one and uh, look. Indonesia want to change this mission, uh, and I think your business has to start uh, uh, restructure. We have to restructure the whole business management on fisheries, especially fishing management, and unlikely. We, we will we will able to give those to continue so and of course from the conversations we had we re, we we see that out there one license there is about 10 vessel some of them i don't even have any license but i have hundreds of ship are here so and mostly it's not belong to indonesians uh, stakeholder but it's from foreign and the indonesian just become the agents it's never easy thing to restructure. Very pain and of course difficult, especially when you try to restructure a huge business interest on it. So, but my president supporting what we, we, we are planning for the vision and missions of the, of the country. So he, he almost approve anything that's necessary actions to be taken regarding this matter. We can empowering the fishermen. We cannot giving them facility or equipment or anything for fishing when the fish is not there anymore. We can have a lot of budget for, for empowering, but when there is no resource, what you would do? The blue ocean is just the blue ocean, water only, nothing in it. And the resource has been depleted, as what I mentioned, 2003 to 2013, we lost the fisheries household, almost 50%, the business billions of dollars gone. And then on the same time, we start moving into aquaculture, which is was good. But the unsustainable management into aquaculture is also impact into the environment disaster. So it's up for a while and then down again from the aquaculture. So. Indonesia was going into roll coaster those days. So, but, uh, with the support of the president, I'm 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 start to also talking to my neighbor country. So, call all the ambassadors together. We need to work together. I request for support for all uh, for all ambassadors that uh, this job has to be done with the biggest portfolio and the most. And I'm I'm not very very experienced into the bureaucratic uh, in the government uh, uh, role, so I need the support of everyone. I think Thai ambassador are there, China, Philippines, so to support Malaysia also. So that we want to do a moratorium into ex-foreign vessel, and then that's done for six months, but since our investigation not enough, we extend another six months. So we have one year, to investigate and analyze, uh, uh, analyze all the, the the business chains and everything what's happened in this uh, fishing industry in Indonesia, and we also ban on transshipment for our uh, territorial and EEZ. So within Indonesia water, you can't do transshipment anymore. What you can still do is from the catching uh, area to the port. A transship to the other boat to carry for 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 process. That's okay, but transship, especially to foreign vessel, is not allowed anymore. By that, we can finally fully able to effectively enforce our constitutions, number forty five two thousand nine, where 
it's said and it's me uh, it's it's it state we can't sink the illegal unreported unregulated fishing vessel that catch illegally fish in our water so we start the action for the trend effect we cannot do on mild measures because it's too many and such thousands of foreign vessels fishing in your water for decade mean there are a lot of connectivity with also circle of power politics and many business stakeholders if you want to do one by one i might have to shut down the whole law enforcement team i have i might have to fired half of my office which is almost impossible let let blame to no one we just want to fix for the future so we put gathered together with the president's uh, strong strong uh, support and he mentioned it in every national meeting national seminar we want this to be done to be to continue and to be able to implement and to effectively run the program towards Indonesia's maritime axis and towards Indonesia to be able to have its future from its natural resources in the ocean. So it's it just take the ownership. So so in the last three years the theme of sinking vessel is is become a national uh, how you call it euphoria or whatever. So in one hand it's a kind of a bully in the media social but it's also a good thing to wake up everybody hey you don't do this she gonna sink you you gonna do this you it, it's something uh, uh, but it's an actually it's a very serious work that we are doing and its result with the deterrent effort action we had is economy is start moving the research analysis we had with Santa Barbara uh, University 2016, an example, we have the increase of biomass, incredible. And that's also proven by the stock of our face that's increased incredibly every year. And uh, the last 2016 is already 12.5 million tons. And we knew from several study, many part of the world, the biomass is decreased three times faster than it should. And we are learning that our ocean is much more nutrients, much more rich, much more, and it's bringing the possibility of business. We, we only calculate a few type of a fish because that's the only fish that we have uh, record for quiet years and that's reflect into our stock that we calculate in all our regional uh, the increase of the MSY this is the stock that is uh, able to be harvested sustainably so uh, the last uh, numbers we haven't had yet so but it's approximate uh, almost uh, 13 million tons more in the same time this stock up our export is also increase but the most for us we feel very good is that all done by local by indonesian fishing vessel only so the grow is only for indonesian fishing vessel after the moratorium finished the president issue number 44 uh, regulations which is putting foreign fishing vessel uh, basically fishing industry into negative list on foreign investment but on the same time we substitute foreign can invest hundred percent in processing plant where before they only can invest minority so we give stake hundred percent if you want to buy process your product we will give you hundred percent ownership but for fishing we stop it and we only allowed Indonesian investment, Indonesian vessel, Indonesian fishermen. And yes, numbers are coming up more convincing. The purchase power index from our fishermen, which is stuck in, in 104, 102 before, now is into 110. In several area even, 
111, 112. But in average, national is uh, 109, 110. Increase almost 10%. And the second, the competitiveness of business in fisheries, if you see before the, 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 the lines, also increased for almost 20%. And that's reflecting into reality now, the fishermen catch the fish more and closer and bigger size. So they don't catch that far away anymore. Just an example, these pictures of, of, uh, of uh, Kaimana, you find they find skipjack within lagoon area. It's very rare. For 20 years, they never see that. They never see tuna, 20 kg, 30 kg. No. Small fishermen with two meter boat, they get 90 kilogram yellowfin tuna. And that's enough $750 for a day living, which is very much uh, a lot of money for Indonesia on such a remote area. So, and that's increasing our export almost uh, 5 to 10% every year, gradually. And it's all done by local resources, by domestic resources, by domestic capacity, by domestic uh, uh, capability. And of course, the market is open. For the first time, after three years, we enforce this. Uh, we finally become number one for balanced trade in Southeast Asia, which before also on the bottom. So you can see here the numbers. And also the last economy report of this year, we are, uh, fisheries become the only commodity that's supporting the surplus into our balance rate. Where other commodity are deficit, fisheries has become the only one that's surplus. And other than that, we also, able to increase the consumption of our uh, uh, Indonesians uh, people before they only eat average 36 kilogram. We continue campaign and the position into 46.49. While we also pressing our import down almost 70%. So the catch increase, the import down, the consumption increase, the export increase. I think those numbers are the one you just need on economic growth. While on the same time, also fisheries uh, uh, price become the only one who's, who, who, who contribute into deflation. Where any other commodity are uh, inflate the, the economy, fisheries is the only one deflate. Why? Because the price domestically down. But with the global situation, economy, the dollars up, export means good. I hope this is not just uh, accidentally, but it is because we are doing the right policy. And within three years, that number seems to be consistent. And I think that's what we had gained from our, from our, from our uh, actions on combating illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing, and continue to manage sustainably the way how we want to fish our, to harvest our fish. Example, we issue regulation into, uh, into fisheries industry for human rights compliances. We do this in 2016. Why we need to do this with the Benjina case that's come up worldwide, become a big shock to everyone that there are slavery, modern slavery practices into fishing industry. And it's also proving more and more with the vessel that we size and we work together with Norway, with UNODC, with everybody, we size several, several uh, vessel and we understand that those practice uh, exist. I would call all state now to have more stronger, stronger action and stronger opinion on this transnational organized crime on fishing industry. You can't say they're only fisheries crime. We also have to start define appropriately what is fisherman, what is seaman. So, and what is the corporation's uh, fishing industry? You cannot say a fisherman when a ship is 500 GT 
moving three quarter of the globe, facing as a country distant facing at somebody else water, as a just a fisherman. And from our size of many boat that we get, it's it's so many other crime is also in it. Just an example, this one. They carry, this is a tuna long line, ex-Taiwan. Coming into our water, it was Indonesia registered, and they still hold Indonesian license, fishing license, a fake one, though, but I mean they had been used that one before for fishing in Indonesia water, carrying 1.37 tons of sabu. Sabu is a uh, heroin, uh, aphthamine. And we size such a boat three within just three months. Other than that, we also find the fuel smuggling for the activity at the high seas transshipment. So what we, we, we see here, ban on transshipment is a very important component and part to basically enforce your policy. Without you ban on transshipment, everything is, will be still done at the high seas. And remember, the high seas until today, on the name of free navigations, it's basically nobody jurisdictions. What we see now, the modus uh, operation of, of several illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing, they have, they have moved the operation base at the high seas. Indonesia water become a very, how you call it, uh, threatened for those uh, illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing vessels. So what they do, they are now using the link, the affiliated vessel of Indonesian flag vessel to catch, to do all the logistic and brought it out over the high seas. And there the collector ship are waiting. And the last we got, uh, one big vessel, STS-50. They have eight flag, eight flag. So Viking, the one before 25 flag. So almost every single kind of uh, this, this operation vessel, they have several flag. Uh, the STS-50 was with 10 Russian crew and 20 Indonesian seamen. I think what Mr. Gunnar uh, means with the Indonesian fishers are the Indonesian seamen. Many of these Indonesian seamen baying on board on such fishing boat is as a victim of human trafficking. And many of them, they're living on board for years, two years, without ever any opportunity to land anywhere. They're only anchoring around the port or even at the high seas. They transfer from one boat to another. If they would have their break or their rest, it would be at shore, not at the port, because they don't have documents, no documentations, nothing. And the STS-50, it's a very sophisticated vessel. They have anti-radar uh, tracking, anti, basically you cannot trace the communication. The ship is really well equipped as a military ship, I think, because the, the, it, it's incredible the way they, they operate right now. And um, we work together, of course, with the authority from Korea and Indonesia because they had been uh, operate one of the uh, operate operator uh, Russian that's live in South Korea and. We worked together to, to trace, to continue, and this boat had been free, uh, escape, able to escape from China port, Dalian, and then also from Togo. So you see in this matter why Indonesia fights the illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing uh, consistently. If you see the, the growth of the, the stock, Six and a half million tons to 12.5 million tons. The six million tons more stocks. That's your saving. If it's calculate a dollar, multiply a dollar a kilo, that's a six billion dollars.
huge economy value. And I think it's necessary also for no international to come together. Because many other countries, they don't have the capacity. They don't have the ability to patrolling, to control their water. An example, Palo, with 20,000 people and, and EEZ as big as France. Maybe France in France. But the friends in, in, the, in the whole France, I think they are number one for, for EEZ. So it's quite huge. And so far, they, 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 they basically cannot utilize their resources. And country distant fishing come and take all of it. Now, one of the problem is many that's not really, I think, seen by a lot of country, that the way IUUF practice is they will put in legal procedure one vessel, but they will have 20 other or maybe 10 other out there at the high seas, the same color, the same name, the same number, the same size of vessel, the duplicate vessel. So, and they can mirroring with the technology. The remember one of the the trace tra track on the satellite. We see the boat is at the at the southern sea, but actually they're still in our water because they make the the, the mirroring on the on the ice. So they do anything that can be unseen and invisible. And. It's very important to all states that have marine resources to start discuss together what's the best way on cooperation to protect and to make and to assure that their resources, it's not stolen anymore. To see what we have, the numbers that we gain in the last three years, it should be an evidence for everybody to start thinking that what it's lost from us is billion of dollars of this practice. Other than that is humanity violence with human rights. Second, the impact on environment. Most of those vessels are using the dredging bottom troll without any exclusions uh, door for turtle or for dolphin, they don't care. Sarks is one of the, the, the spacious target for them because the fin is so expensive. And as well as many other endangered spacious animals. A week ago, we just caught one, one, one vessel with full of monkeys, full of turtles, full of sharks to be transported to Philippines and from Indonesia water. And this is not only one boat. With, with 5.8 million square kilometers of EEZ, it's not easy to watch this. The ICE, the only ship of 300 GT, but they have so many small boats that's also coming in and going over our border. We can't control this. So Detran effect is one of the, the way to make an un visible kind of uh, protections because they, they're scared. But still, they try because the value, the billions of dollars business in it. And at the moment, with, with, with all we try, with our ocean conference, some several seminar, and, and, and a lot of more discussions. But one thing we have to be agree that the high seas need protection because at the moment they with the awareness coming up just think peru last 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 month was catching one of the biggest processing vessel in the world and then ecuador was also catch one of the big vessel with uh, 400 tons of sharks and timor leste got 15 big vessel and uh, we, we all work together and it's now, the awareness is make them less and less uh, uh, feasible to be operate in, in, in nearest to the islands. But they still do. Where their home base now is at the high seas. To remind you back, I 
That's what I said. We had about 7,000 more foreign vessels. They gone now from our water. Our questions, do they go home and grounded at their port? Mm -mm, unlikely. Maybe 10%. The smaller boat, 100 GT, 200 GT, yeah. But the, the above 200 cross stone fishing vessel, they will sail around the globe. We see some of them already in Pacific, South America, in Bering Sea. So it's, it's an, open, an open awareness to be increased here. Don't say, I don't have problem in my water. But there are many states that say that. What we see from what we had experience on investigation, they also know uh, restructuring the organization better. We see it more international cooperation. We see more nationality on, on crewing the ship that they do. We, we didn't so far aware that Russia is in it, but now we see that the, the Russian crew are also in many ships. And they, they, they also camouflage with anything. Example, your water is not allowed foreign flag. They will buy the, the domestic ship with the local people and they will operate with the same manner. And they're not going to report their catch. They're not going to re re follow your regulations. Because it's, it's, it's good money to, to be unregulated and unreported. Stakes, evasions, and everything. We had worked a lot trying our best, but still it's also not easy to convince uh, the, 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 the bureaucrat to work on this because it, it is not easy. The second, the money that's involved is also so big. So they brab every single possibility to be caught in, in any manners. So I think this is what I, I, I could share. So uh, it's time to gather the world to have a plan on action with the high seas. We talk climate change. You talk about fear on deforestation. Forest is only, if, if the whole world have forests, it's only 29% of the whole planet. 71% is oceans. So the threat in the ocean, if it is 10%, it's still bigger than the threat of the land. So you can't deny that ocean is an important part, component of climate change. And what happened at oceans right now is like, is like a forest. Dark. Not everybody sees it. You stricken the, the patrolling and the monitoring at your EEZ, they move to the high seas. Why? Because high seas is a free zone. It's kind of duty free to do anything, any crimes. And we should not forget, high seas is 61% of that 71% of our planet. We should not allowing it to be uncontrolled and become the free zone. To start with, I, I will continue to promote the ocean rights. If us, a part of this world, have a human right, why don't we entitle oceans also a human right? Kind, so it's an ocean right. By having it a right, everybody will be compliant and obliged to protect the oceans. Ocean is us. We need the ocean for the future, economy, and for also food security. The cheapest protein diet resource is oceans. Yes, Norway is one of the country that you can learn how effective and profitable is uh, aquaculture. But to go to the level of Norway, we, s we have to learn and need a big investment. And in developed countries like, like, like us who are still learning, sometimes 
the the growth of the aquaculture is bring impact a lot to the environment especially in a tropic area most of the coastal aquaculture an example will remove a lot of mangrove so that's another threat to climate change that's another threat of uh, also seafood supply because mangrove mo mo mostly are the nursery ground for the fish for the all the sea creatures so to 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 see this it's uh, uh ocean is very important thing for us it's economy wise it's environment wise and also i think w when when those archipelagic states are living in property they have to move then it's another migrant migrant problems will come around the globe and you don't want that to be happen politic instability example indonesia could not live from its resources we are 250 million poverty happened economy bad you don't want to have Indonesians immigrants because numbers 10 percent is 25 millions Singapore Korea will be flooded <laughs> so it's so important to support the strength the stability of Indonesia to be in its regions become one of the motor on on trigger on, on, on economic growth, politically or economically. We are too big to fail. 250 million, and it's growing two to 3% every year still. So I think we are the biggest right now in Southeast Asia for population. After India, is, for democracy country, I think we are number three. So it's huge. We have to be able and, 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 and live from our resources, especially oceans. And its neighbor has to respect this and support this. So with the cooperation so far we have with Nordic country, and I hope we also will get support from our neighboring country to work together. That's whatever business is interest we need to start manage the oceans in sustainable manners because still the cheapest the cheapest protein resource farming cow cattle or pig or whatever it needs space that's what we scream right now we don't have space anymore and water also need for all those aquaculture Reconstructions, nature is it's it's need very, very intense capital, very intense technology, and uh, so, in my point of view, ocean is very important as as one of the of the its natural resources to be kept sustained, to be kept productive, for us, and. If the productivity is not sustained, it also will threat to us. So thank you very much. I think um, uh, yeah. turned on. Thank you. So uh, I think uh, will the minister has to leave in uh, three minutes. But we'll have time for one, maybe two questions if they're short and pointed. So uh, while you prepare your questions, I'll pick two of you. Um, let me just say that this was um, very uplifting and, uh, uh, and also um, very clear. Uh, you gave very clear evidence on the on the magnitude and gravity of of this of this challenge, and it's it's very clear that this is a transnational issue. Uh, it has to be solved by international cooperation. Um, it's also very impressive to to hear 
what uh, you have managed to to do with poli policy reforms in, in Indonesia. So uh, let we have two quick questions for you, uh, Madam Minister. Uh, we'll start here. If you can uh, stand up and say your name. Of course. I'm Valdemar Kutz, uh, Ambassador of Chile. I wanted to uh, congratulate you, Minister Susi, because you're a true uh, ocean champion. I've known you from many uh, our ocean conferences, and I've, I've seen you in action, and what you, or you showed us today is a, a, a proof of that. Um, Indonesia will host the our ocean conference this year in October. Norway will host it next year, also in October 2019. Will you uh, focus again on IUU fishing? Uh, well that's one question. Second question, uh, what do you think about uh, international treaties such as the Port State Measures Agreement or regional fisheries management organizations? And are you considering uh, having such a large EEZ to uh, have uh, um, satellite applications in order to combat this flaw? Thank you. The answer, Derek? Okay. Okay, so uh, the satellite that we are using right now is uh, we have our own satellite uh, tracking, but we also work together with Global Fishing Watch. So we share our VMS data. And today, I just got the list, the, 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 the statistic that Indonesia at the moment is number four owners of vessel that is at high seas. So, because uh, at the moment, politically, also very strong pressure to relieve the deterrent effect actions. People are very scared and they try to lobby political uh, uh, side to, con to say, don't continue that one. And we keep continue the, the very tough measures on, on sinking the boat basically is kind of the only settlement for illegal poachers. So, and uh, do we will take the IUU as one of the main uh, topic? Yes. Other than marine debris, plastic debris, an example, plastic waste at sea, and also the conservations, IUU fishing is a part of the conservations. Without you, you, you handle the IUU fishing, you won't reach the conservation as you wish. Because IUU fishing is also do the destructive fishing, an example. They, they use poisons. They use, uh, they use uh, uh, dynamite uh, fishing method. For example, they look for sea cucumber, for some type of coral. They do such a destructive fishing. So... Illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing should be one of the very important topics that we would like to, to, to also address, other than plastic and, and, uh, and other marine debris. I think uh, it, it, it's what I see, it is difficult to, to, to try to bring what I have gone experience on dealing with illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing to everyone. I mean, yesterday I was with Carmino Fela, the Commission of European. He was, I did not realize that so much of a crimes in it. And maybe in Europe, it's only about fishing. They, they go into somebody else EZ and catch them. But in Asia, an example happened in our coastal, normally what's happened is other than drug smuggling, Indonesia has 5 million drug user, addicted people. We need, if it is a gram a week, we need 5 tons a week. That's big business. So, and the best way to transport for this organization is with fishing vessel, as well as human trafficking, immigrant. Also, there are several, uh, uh, Australia has a big problem with the immigrant before, but with the uh, approach of illegal, undeported, unregulated, Fishing uh, practice in Indonesia is also decreased down the immigrant. And those immigrants are also traffic people. They pay to be transported. And uh, uh, what, what, what we see here is also other smuggling of uh, other product, commodity, from, from uh, alcohol to, 
textile, to anything. Undeclare, without the custom declaration and tax evasion. Ev so, so that's what they do. And on the way back, they, they're bringing the fish, but also the monkey, the turtle, the birds, anything that's more... If they are on the list number one in Citus, that's the one they will chase because it's a big money. So maybe from Africa is uh, ivory and many other uh, animals. In Indonesia is birds, crocodile, turtle, dolphin. It's become another commodity, life or that they are trading. So it is very important, I think, to address. I knew a lot of country did not interested to the topic of IUUF, but I think Chile, Ecuador, us, Pacific country, Africa, also the one that strong want this topic to be in it because without that, there's no meaning, the conservation. What you conserve, there's nothing anymore left. And the biggest threat to the oceans, I think right now, other than those debris pollution is illegal fishing. And at the moment, with the, with the awareness coming more, they, they also use more sophisticated technology. The ship is getting bigger. So the super poor designers now around the globe that say that, that fish are maybe size of 2,000, 3,000 to 5,000 tons. And that's definitely, they gonna pull out in each time at least two, 300 tons fish. If you talk about two, three hundred tons of fish in a catch, that's a, a catch of three thousand artisanal fishermen that our as an archipelagic state have. That's the livelihood of three thousand people in one time they catch, and hundreds of them. So it is very important. I hope you agree to us. <laughs> I think that's. Thank you. It's already answer all your question. I, th I think uh, I look at the, the watch and we, uh, we have to end there. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, let's give uh, the minister a hand. Thank you. So thank you.